Welcome, 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 everybody, to a new installment, another week, another Friday of YouTube Live with Mr. David Green himself. David, how are you this evening? Kyle, you might have the wrong mic selected. There. Oh, no. Are you serious? I don't but know I'm if you have a, is your light turned on you? Is my light turned on? Yeah, you're like your spotlight. Why am I too dark? You are. I got a fancy controller. Watch this. Let there be light. There we go. Shouldn't be as bad. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Glad to see you here. It's time to learn about wealth building. It's time to learn about how to navigate this new economy. And it's time to step up our game because it's going to be getting tough. Uh, a couple of pieces of housekeeping. We're hiring a bookkeeper. Or I'm hiring a bookkeeper to do the books for my different businesses. So if you guys know anyone remote that's looking for a full-time job, not just to take on a client, I want someone just for me, uh, let me know. If you're someone who's looking for a career change, you want to get into being a real estate agent or a loan officer or a property manager or anything like that, send us a message because we're going to be hiring for our companies here pretty soon. And we've got some pretty cool news. Spartan League is going to be taking a significant step up. Big upgrades are going to be coming your way. Imagine Netflix for real estate investors. So in the near future, coming into the uh, latter half of this year or the beginning part of next year, you're going to be getting a call every weekday. So maybe even two calls a day. So imagine that you're sitting at home and there's nothing good on TV. So instead, you look at the schedule and you realize there's a short-term rental analysis going on. There's a process on how the construction of an ADU should look. You can learn about permitting. You can learn about uh, why Kyle has been having so much success with health and fitness, what my weightlifting routine looks like and how our members are losing weight. You can learn about what medium-term rentals look like, managing your own properties, analyzing potential deals, turning one house into several units all of the cool stuff that you want to learn about. And it's actually like a university where you can go and two times a day, you're going to have a call where there is an instructor that's going to be teaching on a topic and you're going to have a schedule that you can look and see what that is about. Kyle and I think this is going to be a game changer for people that want to learn more about real estate investing. And it's hard for them to find a mentor. Uh, also, something that's cool about this is it's not one specific thing. Like, I'm an expert in medium term rentals, or I'm an expert in subject two, or I'm a house flipper. We're going to have courses on all of that taught by experts that do this in the industry for you to learn. Now, it's going to be much more expensive than Spartan League is right now, as I'm sure you can assume, because it's going to be like getting an education. So we have decided that people that are already in Spartan League are going to be grandfathered in. They are not going to have anything change because they've been loyal from the beginning. So if you guys are in Spartan League, when that changes, the low monthly cost will be all that it is. But if you're going to join after that, there's going to be a higher cost, basically like your tuition for the year to get in the group. So if you're somebody who wants to join a program where you can learn about all types of different real estate investing stuff, the stuff that I have to deal with every single day that we're going to be teaching you, and you want an instructor that you can ask questions of and other students that you can kind of click into, Kyle, where can they go if they want to learn more about this? SpartanLeague.com. That's going to be the best place to find everything, you guys. SpartanLeague.com. That website will be changing a little bit too, but please go check it out. Kyle, what are we going to talk about today? Well, yeah, that's a great question. We're actually going to be talking about Americans and they're depleting their savings. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in the past, and I'm curious, you guys, drop in the chat if you are one of those people. Are you somebody that is uh, maybe dipping into their savings right now? Are you feeling the crunch? Are you feeling like you need uh, more income? But we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how, you know, by, by October, Americans might be broke. Right, they may be uh, out of savings, out of runway, and uh, really kind of stuck, and maybe starting to use credit cards. So, I don't know about you, David, but uh, you know that could have an impact on our economy. Uh, you and I are kind of seeing, you know, out there, people are uh, losing their jobs. People are are trying to apply for new jobs. Um, the The economy is definitely shifting and changing. It feels like. Yeah, that's the case. And if you're somebody who's changing jobs right now, my two cents, something I would advise. Don't just look about where you get the most money or where you have the best benefits or the things we typically looked at. 
Look into which companies are going to need you in six months or in two years. Uh, we're seeing a ton of people getting laid off from high paying jobs where they've been automated to a large degree. I mean, several people a week are reaching out to me right now. Many of them people that we were looking to hire at one point and they took a job somewhere else and now they are losing that job and it's because the company doesn't need them. Not trying to scare everybody here, but I am saying this is my two cents on the matter. When the government raises interest rates, I don't believe it causes prices to go down. I don't think it stops inflation. What I think it does is slows the velocity of money. What that means is if interest rates go higher, Kyle is less likely to spend his paycheck at a restaurant. The restaurant owner is less likely to spend their paycheck at the gas station. The gas station owner is less likely to buy a new car. The person who sells cars is less likely to join Spartan League and so on and so forth. When we stop spending money and money stops changing hands, everyone starts to feel poor. Now, when that happens, you see some pretty significant issues in the economy. One of them is that companies stop spending money freely. So if that company isn't receiving as much income because everyone else is spending less of their money, the first thing they do is look at their profit and loss statement and say, where are we fat? Kyle and I do this all the time. Where do we need to make some cuts? Why are we spending this much on marketing? Why are we paying for all these leads when they're not converting? Why are we paying this much in rent? Why are we spending this much on events? And all of that stuff gets cut. And one of the things that will get cut will be employees. Because when companies aren't making a lot of money, they don't need as many fish cleaners because they're not catching as much fish. And it's very easy to get locked into this position where you feel sorry for yourself because you have to have a W-2 and you've been told it's terrible until you don't have a W-2 and you have no money coming in. And then you're seeing what's actually terrible. Having a job is not the end of the world. Being unemployed is much worse. So as we continue to see rates going up and we see the velocity of money slowed, I think you're going to see more companies looking at their books and laying people off, similar to what happened over there at Twitter slash X with Elon Musk. Yeah, very well said. Uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and start a ticker at the bottom. Uh, there's a telephone number down there, 833-777-0309. Send a text message to that number if you want to come in tonight and talk specifically about savings. Talk about what's going on in your world. Uh, we've got a video we're going to jump right into. Uh, this is from the YouTuber. His name is Minority Mindset. He's going to be talking about uh, what the Fed has actually come out and said. The Fed has come out and said Americans will deplete their savings by October. So let's take a look at this and then we'll be back in one quick minute. where they said essentially that Americans are about to run out of money. Now, the reason why they're saying this is because you can't hear that, can you? During the 2020. No, it's, we can now. Okay. You could hear it. Yeah. It started yeah. off. Not okay. Americans saved more money than really ever before. And over the last few years, we've been seeing this pandemic savings get eaten away because of inflation. And now, according to their numbers and their predictions, which they say has some little chance of being inaccurate, but they believe that by October of 2023, Americans are going to begin running out of money. So let me actually dissect what this blog post said. If you want to read it for yourself, I will link it for you down in the description. But the title of this blog post is Access No More Dwindling Pandemic Savings. And what they say is that households rapidly accumulated unprecedented levels of excess savings in the 2020 pandemic relative to previous recessions. AKA, during the 2020 recession, Americans didn't really feel any economic pain because there was so much money printing thanks to the Federal Reserve Bank. And what they said, to quantify it, is that there was about $2.1 trillion in excess savings during this pandemic time held by American households. Well, because of the high inflation, Americans couldn't keep all this excess savings, naturally. So this slowly started to eat away at this $2.1 trillion of excess savings that was accumulated during the pandemic. And what the Federal Reserve Bank said is that by March of 2023, this year, there was only $500 billion of this $2.1 trillion excess savings left in the hands of American households. By June of this year, just a few months after March, there was only $190 billion dollars of the 2.1 trillion dollars left and now what they're saying is that by october of 2023 all of this excess pandemic money all this excess savings is going to be gone because of the higher inflation what they said is that 
There is considerable uncertainty in this outlook, but we, the Federal Reserve Bank, estimate that these excess savings are likely to be depleted by October 2023. Now, the reason why the savings are being depleted is really not that much of a surprise. We've been seeing very high inflation for a long time, and inflation has cooled, but that doesn't mean that the prices of things have fallen. So if we have all this cumulative inflation, because remember, inflation is compounding, right? It's not just you see 2% inflation in one year, and that's it. It's 9% inflation one year, and then another 4% inflation on top of that. So inflation compounds on top of one another, while wages have not been growing fast enough to keep up with inflation. So on one hand, we have the prices of things that have risen faster than wages. And then number two is people also want to keep maintaining their lifestyles, right? So we keep wanting to buy the nice things naturally. So on one hand, the prices of things have risen, and second, people want to have the nice things. And this is where now, as the prices of things have risen and we want more things, people are digging into their savings saying, hey, I got the cash to buy it where I can afford it. I can finance it. Banks will be willing to give me the credit to buy it. I can go out and buy this thing. And that has been happening. And that has been contributing to this economic growth because our economic system runs on spending. When you go to Chipotle, when you go to uh, Sweet Green and you buy the extra guac, guess what? They're making money. If you're not buying it, they're not making money. If businesses are making money, they can hire more employees and they can open more stores. If they're not making money, they can't open more stores. They can't hire employees and they might have to shut down stores. So our entire economic system depends on you spending your money. If you don't have any money to spend or if you can't keep spending money because all of your money is going to your rent and your groceries, well, now you can't afford the extra guac. So now other businesses get hurt. And this is where now it's very important to understand this that if people lose the ability to spend because now they don't have savings to dip into or they're maxing out their credit cards or now they're dipping into their home equity lines of credit and they can't keep pulling out more cash because equity is dropping, well, then that means consumers lose the ability to spend. And if consumers lose the ability to spend, the entire economy loses the ability to grow. Now, you can start to see why that becomes a bad thing because if the economy cannot grow, that means jobs cannot grow. If jobs can't grow, that means jobs shrink. And if jobs shrink, that means people lose incomes. And if people lose incomes, well, that can be a bigger problem. So you start to see how everything gets connected and why spending is such a big part of this entire economic system because if people don't have the ability to spend, and in the economic system, it doesn't matter if you're spending the cash that you were to earn, it doesn't matter if you're spending savings in your bank account, and it doesn't matter if you're spending your credit card debt. It's all the same in the economic system. Now, on your end, on the financially educated side, you obviously do not want to be going into debt to finance your guac or your Lululemon or your Gucci. But on the economic side, spending is spending, whether you're spending debt or the money you were to earn. The more you spend, the more the economy grows, which is why when Americans go into debt to go and finance their Gucci and then Louis Vuitton, you are stimulating the American economy, which is why it's not your patriotic duty to stimulate the American economy. You want to be stimulating your own finances first. But then the Federal Reserve Bank went on to quote the Bureau of Economic Analysis, talking about how household disposable income has changed. And we covered this in Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter. If you have not joined Market Briefs yet, it's an easy and free way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the markets. You can read Market Briefs in less than five minutes every morning, and it's free. If you want to go and read Market Briefs, I got the link for you down in the description below. But you can also go to briefs.co slash market. And here's what they said. The Bureau of Economic Analysis recently revised its previous estimates to show household disposable income was lower and personal consumption was higher than previously reported for the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first quarter of 2023, meaning household disposable income was lower than what they reported initially and personal consumption was higher. Income's lower and spending higher than what our government numbers are essentially reporting. What does that mean? Well, when you say incomes are lower, that means inflation is growing even faster than people's incomes. That means more and more people have to dig deeper into their savings in order to spend. And if consumption is higher, that means people keep wanting to buy the nice things. So people are consuming more than what their wages are providing. And obviously you have nowhere else to go besides the savings that you have or the debt that you have. And this is where the Federal Reserve Bank says, our estimates suggest that a relatively small amount, around $190 billion, remains in the overall economy. Remember, there was about $2.1 trillion 
of excess pandemic savings. They're saying today there's about $190 billion left. And this is what remains in the overall economy. And we, the Federal Reserve Bank, expect the aggregate stock of excess savings will likely be depleted during the third quarter of 2023, aka by the by October of 2023. That is the current quarter for which the initial data will be released later. Now, they do say a couple of times that can there be inaccuracies in here? Yes, absolutely. There might be inaccuracies in here. However, the general idea that you want to understand is that our economy has been able to grow despite the issues with inflation, despite the issues with interest rates, despite the issues with global issues, because consumers are strong. That is the backbone of the economy, consumers. And remember, consumers are everybody, rich people, poor people, middle class people. Everybody's a consumer. And as long as people have the ability to spend and shop, the economy can continue to grow. And what we've been seeing is obviously inflation has been compounding and the ability for people to keep spending gets hurt as you continue to see high inflation. Well, now, according to the Fed, the spending ability from the savings that people have will be depleted by October of this year. But why is October significant? Because October is also when student loans restart. And I made a video recently where uh, some economists were talking about how this student loan restart is going to hurt consumers' ability to spend because millions of Americans are going to be hit with a brand new four, five, six hundred dollar monthly payment that they forgot that they had, which is going to hurt Americans' ability to have this disposable income. Because now if you have to spend $500 to pay down your student loans, that's $500 that you can no longer spend at the mall or wherever it is that you want to spend or even invest that money. But unfortunately, our economic system, our economic growth is based off of spending, not investing so much more on the spending side. There's a whole different world of investing, which I'm not talking about in this video. But this is where, again, it's so important to remember our economic system runs on spending. Spending has been booming because people have the ability to spend. Why do they have the ability to spend? Part of the reason is because incomes have gone up, not as much as inflation, but they have gone up. Number two, people have savings. Number three, people have the ability to go into credit card debt and pull home equity lines of credit out of their homes. Now what we're seeing is that incomes have not been rising fast enough. So that domino is falling, which leaves now people have the ability to dig into their savings. Well, it looks like the savings are starting to leave, which leaves people's ability to finance their spending. Credit cards, home equity lines of credit. Now we've seen credit card debt hit a brand new record high of around a trillion dollars, but people still have the ability to pull out cash out of their homes. And I made this video and I also talked about this in my investor summit. If you haven't seen my investor summit, I have it for you down in the description, but Wells Fargo, one of the biggest banks in the world, like them or hate them, they are one of the biggest banks in the world. And what they said, they put out this research report saying essentially, hey, you got a whole lot of home equity in your homes. Americans do. Pull the cash out of your homes. Pull the cash out of your home equity because now you can spend that money. You do not want to go out and do that, especially financing liabilities. But this is where now you can start to see if people need to continue spending, where can you spend? Incomes are not enough. Savings are being depleted, which leaves debt. And if people can no longer dig into their debt because they get maxed out on the credit cards or because home equity starts to drop, well, then now that spending ability goes away. And if the spending ability goes away, well, then that impacts every other part of the economy. And this is why I keep saying time and time again, 2023 is not the year for you to go out and finance a new truck. 2023 is the year for you to go out and get financially smart. Use this as a year as things are okay. While it might not seem like everything's great, things are still okay. Use this as a time to build a financial education, to build a financial preparedness. Because if we do start to see more economic pain next year or the year after that or the year after that, you want to make sure you can capitalize on it. Because the reality is economic slowdowns create opportunities. But the only people that can capitalize on those opportunities are the people that are prepared. And so if you're prepared, it doesn't cost you anything. Like, sure, you have to make some sacrifices, but it doesn't cost you anything to be prepared. But if you are prepared, well, then if something bad were to happen, you can capitalize on opportunities. If you're not prepared and something bad happens, well, are you the one that gets screwed over? So might as well just be prepared. And even if nothing bad happens, all you're doing is just making yourself a little bit more financially educated. 
And this is why, again, the financial education, the financial preparedness are so important to living a truly financially free life because now you can win when the economy is growing. You can also win when the economy is slowing. All right. Very good. Beautiful stuff. So, uh, yeah, as the great Bobby Knight once said, right, if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Uh, quick, basic recap of what he just talked about. Very simple, right? People are making the same amount of money as they have been making. If, if anything, some people are losing their jobs or they're getting cut back. Uh, but inflation is increasing. So there's this gap in lifestyle happening where people are now having to dip into their savings to maintain the level of lifestyle. And as a result, that those savings are starting to deplete. And that could potentially be an issue because what's going to happen is disposable income, right? The extra income that you have uh, after all your bills and important things have been paid. A lot of people have less disposable income. That's the money you spend at different businesses, maybe eating out at restaurants or maybe to buy a car or maybe to uh, you know go to the movies or whatever it is, your extra income that you spend to keep the economy going is starting to go away. That disposable income is depleting. And so uh, we can see potentially businesses being hurt because of that. Um, and we can also see people um, starting to, to potentially cut back or take on more credit card debt, which is also going to perpetuate their issues. So as a result, um, people are trying to maintain that lifestyle, even though that gap is widening. And number two, uh, it's a really good time to prepare and start thinking ahead. David, what did you think of Minority Mindset's uh, information and kind of what he was dropping this evening? I feel like he was on a loop there saying the same thing for a long time. but like 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, people say I may do the same thing. Let me know in the comments. Do I make the same point too many times in a row when I need to just move on or not? Uh, and I feel like he said something very similar to what I said in the beginning. I articulated it differently, of course. Uh, he does a good job telling stories, and I think he speaks to people that are not as financially literate as our audience, which probably knows a little more, which is why he takes longer to speak. Anytime you're speaking to newbies, you usually take longer to make your point than when it's experienced people. Uh, but he's saying something very similar, which is as the economy slows down, people spend less money. And that is why I wrote the book Pillars. It almost couldn't be better timing that from the time yeah. I started writing it with what I saw coming to now that it's getting ready to land. This is what I really think people need to hear. We've been spoiled, guys, for 10 years. We've had one of the best economies ever because we just printed tons and tons of money. And that's not your fault. It's not my fault. We didn't make the decision to print it. But what you do need to understand is it's not normal to have the economy as easy as it was. It's not normal to have money coming in that easily. And what happens when you get used to it is you start complaining. Like imagine if you had uh, like fresh sushi being delivered to your house every single day that was caught from the ocean that moment and prepared by a chef. In the beginning, you would think this was the most incredible thing you'd ever experience and you'd be eternally grateful but eternal gratitude usually only lasts for a year or two. After a time, it would be like, how come they didn't put a bigger avocado on here? That's not the kind of fish I like the most. I'm tired of this sushi. Why don't they catch me a live chicken? We find things to complain about, everyone. That's happened with the economy. When we had the best economy ever, we still found ways to complain. We still found ways to say it should be even better. I should make money without having to work at all. Oftentimes, when you do things to make things easier for people, they're not grateful for it. They just think it should have been even easier. And we, as a, as a consumer base, have sort of gotten to the point that we expected free passive money. I should buy a rental, and it should take care of itself, and I shouldn't have to do all this work. And why do I have to answer the phone of my client that's getting into my short-term rental wants something? Meanwhile, these people are getting 40% returns on their money, and they're mad they have to answer the phone. Like That's what happens when it gets too easy. I think that's coming to an end. I think we're going to be at a period of time where we're grateful to have a job, where it's not going to be incredible returns on real estate, that we're going to wish we could go back to the way it was, that we're going to wonder why we complain about paying 10 grand over asking price for these deals that had a 30% cash on cash return. And it's a bit of a wake up call. So I don't think this is going to get easier. I think many people need to be focused on defense. That's why we're talking about it because you don't hear many people saying that. Everyone's telling you to buy more, buy more, buy more, do more. Hey, I'm telling you to work more. 
I want you to buy more. You earn the right to buy more by working more, earning more, and saving more. So the principles that are in pil pillars are exactly what the economy is going to need. You can survive this. You can get through it. But your mentality really needs to be survival. This is not a time where you need to be walking in there expecting everything to be handed to you. What do you think, Kyle? Have you seen sort of a different mentality as more and more people are kind of getting the rude awakening of the economy shifting? I am. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm actually not seeing it a ton. I'm seeing a lot of people still live their same lifestyle. I think a lot of people are secretly dipping into savings. They're just not telling it because they want to maintain that high level of lifestyle. I can tell you for me, I have been looking at scaling back. Um, I'm looking to be more disciplined with my budget as of recently. So, so I'm not trying to like eat out as much as I do. Uh, all that discretionary sending, spending the, you know, weekend trips and getaways and stuff like that definitely have reduced because uh, I want to make sure that I have as much reserves as I can. And obviously when you're in the world of real estate, right, there are ups and downs and we're coming, a lot of people have said this and we can see it, we're coming into a down recession, right? There's uh, inflation just continues to get worse. So my biggest concern is there's a lot of people still trying to uphold their lifestyle. And I say, you know, drop the ego, let some of that stuff go, figure out, look at your budget, figure out what you can let go. I've, I've canceled so many subscriptions to streaming services because I don't need them, you know? And so that's one thing I would suggest to other people too, is take a really good look at your budget, figure out what can go, what you can let go of. And if you have some things that, that you need to be spending money on, try to renegotiate those bills down and see if you can uh, get them for less. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you have to be less happy because you're spending less no. money. I really believe, and it's in the book, that when you spend less money, it forces you to think closer and more carefully about what effort you're putting into life. Okay. Like, haven't you heard the story of the little girl who said, my dad used to try to buy my love with gifts. He was busy. He was mm -hmm. working all the time. He didn't give me any time. So he'd buy me a pony. The little kids love it, but when they grow up, they realize I would have rather had a relationship with the person than them just buying me gifts. Okay. Like I do this a little bit too. I don't see my nieces and nephews that often. They don't live by me and I, and I work a lot and I'm busy. So on Christmas time, I try to make up for it with big gifts. That's okay when they're four or five, six, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's not going to work when they're 10, 11, 12. They, like you need to have a real relationship with them. I think honestly, throwing money at problems creates inefficiencies in business and bad relationships. It is better if you're not spending money to create memories with people that mean more. Like you're going to go out to eat less. Well, can you cook with your wife or your husband? Can you make it fun? Can you have a cute little moment where you throw flour at each other? I don't know, like something from a rom-com and then you got to clean it up together. But like, <laughs> can you do things that make memories? Can you take a bike ride together? Can you take a hike together? Can you start a project together and try to get along with each other as opposed to like, oh, let's just go spend $400 on dinner because I, the dinner stopped being cool when you go there all the time, right? I'm not an extravagant guy, but I've been able to eat at really nice restaurants. The first time I ever ate steak at a steakhouse, it blew my mind. Now it's just another damn steak. Right, it, it doesn't keep the satisfaction it has. So it is okay to spend less money. You actually can improve your quality of life when you become more disciplined. Yeah, that's a good point. And you got to do the same thing in your businesses too. I, I, what I've recognized and realized is both in my personal life and even in my business, there were some things that I was paying for specifically out of convenience, right? It's just easier to do this so that I don't have to do it myself. And, uh, I've yeah. scaled some of those things back. Cause I'm just like, you know, what? I'm going to put the work into it. I can put a little extra discipline into my day or into my month and I can do my own bookkeeping or I can do my own whatever. Um, and so that's what I've done is I've also scaled back on things specifically out of convenience. Amazon purchases still really, really tough in this household, but uh, we're getting there. Yeah, that's exactly what you find. When you scale back and you start looking at what we've been paying a bookkeeper for, you're like, I've given you that much money and this is all I get. And then the bookkeeper has to look at their employee and say, they've been paying us this much money and this is all you've given them. And then the employee goes, I don't care. I'm just a W-2 worker. My job is to get paid and not work. And you see how inefficient that whole thing becomes. And so a lot of us probably when the economy is good worth throwing money at things a lot of busy people to get in the habit of doing that just hire someone and then we don't look at what they're doing and then they're on the clock taking our money it's a form of theft but you don't think about it like that no, I, yeah and that's the funny thing a lot of people don't realize that i was thinking this the other day uh i used to believe um 
you know, when I was a W-2 mindset and W-2 employee, I, I would get paid the same regardless of my performance, right? My pay would never go down if I had a slow day or a bad day or not a productive day. I got paid the same no matter what, if I was like peak performance or low performance. And what I've realized is the, the beauty of being self-employed of being an entrepreneur is you only get paid by how well you perform. And yeah. so what that means is I have to treat my body like it's a performance engine, right? Like it's a performance vehicle. So I have to take really good care of it. I have to be disciplined. I have to be focused. I have to not put junk food into it. And the better I can do that, the better I'm going to do for the David Green team and for all of our businesses and the better everyone else does. Because if I don't, then the team and everybody else just tanks and we don't do well. Yeah, imagine that you're on a sports team that has 40 players on the basketball team, okay? You don't try very hard at practice, but you don't care because you get the jersey and the girls just see the jersey. They don't actually go to the games to know if you play or not. You get all the perks that come from being on the team. You get your identity as a basketball player. You get all this awesome stuff, but you're not trying hard at practice. And you think you're safe because you think that every basketball team has 40 people. And you might even convince yourself that they don't know how great you are. And if that coach gave you more credit or more playing time and ran a play for you, then you dive on that loose ball. But you're not going to do it until that point. And in your delusion, you think that you're special. And then a new coach comes in and goes, you know what? We don't need 40 players. We don't need more than 15, maybe 12. I'm cutting two-thirds of this team. All of a sudden, it's kind of scary. I'm going to lose my position. I got to be in the top third of all the players. And if you're lazy and you're fat and you haven't been practicing, you have a bad work ethic, you're the one that gets cut. And you went from thinking you were so smart because you had worked the system to where you didn't have to try hard and you weren't diving on loose balls and you weren't running sprints hard to I wish I had been trying hard for the last six months because now I'm out of shape and I'm not prepared and I'm going to lose in the competition. That is what happens in recessions. That is life. We have periods of time where human beings create a civilization that makes you forget how bad life really is, right? We saw what happened with COVID-19. It was very scary, and we went from thinking we were incredibly safe to terrified from rumors of a virus, mm -hmm. okay? It can go away so fast, and I just want everyone here to remember the coach is coming to cut you at some point. The employers are going to fire you. AI is going to take your jobs. It's going to be very difficult to buy real estate. We complained about it for years that it was unaffordable and not fair. Meanwhile, you could put three and a half percent down on a million dollar asset or a $600,000 asset. We still complain. Now it's getting to where it's almost impossible to buy them at all. So our advice to you is to turn it around quick and be in that top third of players because you've been working hard and you're ready when the uh, when the judge comes to see who's good and who's not, you want to be found on the right side of that. What do you say to the people, David, who are like, well, David, you're just being negative. David, you're just preparing for the worst. You're just thinking that there's a doomsday. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to be bailed out eventually. It always happens. What do you say to people who say that to you? I'd say they're right and they're smart because that is what I'm doing. I am being negative. I am preparing for the worst. And I am thinking there's going to be a doomsday because it makes logical sense to believe there will be. It doesn't make logical sense to believe that the party we've been on from 10 years of stimulus can continue. It's already having consequences. And I've been saying this since I've been on the Bigger Pockets podcast. You guys see what's going on with BRICS? There's a bunch of new countries that are joining that. Now, they're not powerhouses. It's like Ethiopia and Egypt. And they weren't like massive countries, but it shows intent. It shows that other countries are tired of America bullying them around. It shows that they're forming a coalition so that we don't hold all the cards. And if you're smart, when you watch your enemies forming around you, or at least your competition forming around you to take you out, even if you're the best, you don't laugh at them. You, you let that sober you up. If you're the best basketball team, you're the champion. You don't assume you're going to be the champion the next year. What you assume is every team you play is going to give you their best shot. You're going to have to get the best effort from every single team. After you win the championship, it will be harder to succeed. And I do think that way, and I think that more people should be thinking that way. It's easy to forget you're in a competition, but you're not. You, it, you are. You are competing yeah. for the job you want to keep. You're competing for the raise that you didn't even know was a possibility. You're competing for the assets that are in the best places. You're competing for the best talent to work with you. You're competing to build the best core four. You're comp I'm competing for attention. I'm competing for you guys to listen to me instead of somebody else. Everything's a, a competition. Everything is. Some people know they're in it. And in Pillars of Wealth, I talk about that. 
it's naive to think that you're just going to get whatever you want in life and that if you just manifest it, it's going to happen, okay? It happens if you if you visualize it and then go work to achieve it, yes. But manifesting is not just thinking I deserve it and telling yourself an affirmation and then waiting for something to come. It's going out there and winning in the competition. So I'd much rather tell people to prepare for the worst and save their money and invest it wisely and develop a really good work ethic than tell them, hey, it's a great economy. Give me $50,000 and I'll teach you how to flip a house. And then it turns out that they don't have that $50,000 when they need to buy food for their family. Yeah, that's really good. Um, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play the next video. This one is actually coming from Clear Value Tax. Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, it's kind of funny. I like this. So he, the name of his is Feds Predicts Americans Will Run Out of Money by 2023. I just got to jump down to the first comment. It's kind of funny. He says, the Fed is wrong. I'm out of money right now. So here <laughs> you go. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Americans will deplete their savings by October. So this doesn't mean that the U.S. economy is going to collapse overnight, but it does mean that day-to-day -day life will become more challenging for everyday Americans. So I'm going to give you the details. I'm going to give you the stats. But first, I want to give you an overview of the situation. Okay, so right now, everyday Americans are struggling to keep up with their bills. If you feel like you're living paycheck to paycheck, if you feel like you're just running on the hamster wheel day in, day out, then I'm going to, I'm going to show you this. And this is going to be a good explanation of why you feel that way. So I want you to take a look at this. The cost of housing has been ballooning out of control over the past few years. This chart shows how much rent has gone up since 2020. Rent is up 18%. That's just the average. I've read your comments in the previous videos. I know that in some areas, rent increases have just been staggering well above 18%. Now, when you look at the housing market, so I cover the housing market pretty thoroughly. Home prices are near record highs. The 30-year fixed so mortgage interest rates right now, it's averaging 7.5%. So it's no surprise that home affordability is at record lows. Now, let's take a look at vehicles. Here are used vehicle prices since 2020, up 44%. Isn't that just ridiculous? So I analyze the new car market. I analyze the used car market for you. I'm just trying to help people get the best prices possible. So please look forward to my next updates. Now, moving on to gasoline. Since 2020, gasoline prices are up 39%. So it's fallen from its peak, but gasoline prices are creeping back up. And as of today in September, gasoline prices are up year over year. Now, moving on to cereal and grain prices. So we're talking about your typical bread products at the grocery store up 29% since 2020. So I've read your comments saying that before the pandemic, you can get a shopping cart full of groceries for $100. And now that same cart, it costs $150. It costs even more than that. So listen, it's clear, I mean, it should be very obvious that this is why everyday Americans are struggling. I just showed you some of the most basic needs. I showed you housing, vehicles, gasoline, food. So these expenses, they're growing by 20, I mean, they've grown by 20%, 30%, 40%. Since 2020, wages have not grown by 20%, 30%, 40%. And everyday Americans are making up the difference. You know how they're doing that? They're charging more on their credit card or they're dipping into savings. And that is, I mean, you, you know, that's unsustainable and that's very stressful. Now, I want to tell you this. I see many comments requesting that I come up with solutions. And I will bring you solutions. I will make those specific types of videos. My whole channel, my whole mission, it's dedicated to financial education. I will bring you solutions. I prefer that we start off with baby steps, things that will be practical, realistic, and you'll be heading in the right direction. But yes, I will make those specific types of videos, how to make more money, how to save more money, both sides of the equation. So we'll get into that, but in this video, I'm just acknowledging that everyday Americans are struggling, and I'm letting you know I'm letting you know why, and that's very important because first you have to understand the situation for you to improve your situation. Now I want to point this out to you: inflation got out of control; it just spiraled out of control because of all the money printing by the Federal Reserve. So there are other reasons why, but that was the primary reason. Okay, so inflation it was made worse by corporate greed. Businesses were aggressively passing on costs to consumers. Consumers didn't put, so customers didn't 
they didn't put up resistance for the most parts. So people kept buying and corporate profits surged. But now, right now, times have changed. Americans are more strapped for cash than ever. And corporations have recently realized that they just can't keep raising prices and have no pushback. So U.S. consumers are now more diligent in looking for alternatives, looking for substitutes if prices are too high. Okay, so keep that in mind because all of this is connected. Now, I'm going to read you this statement. So I'm going to tell you this, and I know that it's going to upset quite a few people. But this is not coming from me. This is coming from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So the U.S. Federal Reserve has been consistently saying that Americans are flush with cash from their pandemic savings. So the Federal Reserve has been saying this all throughout 2023. And if you've been paying attention to the Fed, I know a lot of people have been, you know that I'm not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating in the least bit. But now the Federal Reserve is saying that Americans are finally running out of money. So listen to this, and this is coming from, this is according to their data. They're saying that excess household savings has been falling for every month for the past 23 months. So here are the numbers. The Federal Reserve said that by 2021, Americans have saved $2.1 trillion. They say that it's now fallen to $190 billion in July, and it's currently falling at a rate of $100 billion a month. So the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco said, and I quote, U.S. households are poised to run out of excess savings that was accumulated since the pandemic by as early as the end of September. Okay, so that's the Federal Reserve. And just a reminder, the Federal Reserve is not a part of the governments. When you look at the government figures, the message is just as bad. The government says that the personal savings rate fell to 3.5% in July. That is down from 4.3% in June, and that's down from 4.7% in May. So the last three months of data, 4.7%, 4.3%, 3.5%. It's falling hard, and that is not good. And to put this into perspective for you, the savings rates was averaging 8.8% in 2019. So that's pre-pandemic. And now it's fallen to 3.5%. Okay, and to make matters worse, student loan payments are restarting in October. 43 million Americans have student loans. The average student loan payment will be $300 to $400 a month, and that is going to be devastating for millions of Americans. So just think about this. The United States of America is a consumer-driven economy. If the U.S. consumer is in bad shape, that means more businesses will go bankrupt. So if you remember, I said this back in 2022, and it's coming true. So I said, so you probably, some of you probably remember that I said that bankruptcies are going to spike in 2023 because of higher interest rates. Now take a look at this headline from Bloomberg: Business bankruptcies soar in August as rising interest rates bite. Bankruptcies have now been posting increases year over year for 13 months straight. Bloomberg says that last week alone. There were six large businesses that filed for bankruptcy. Each of those six businesses had at least $50 million in assets. Okay, but now I want you to, know, I want you to understand what's going on. The current business environment, it's more challenging for small businesses. And the reason why is that for small businesses, it's harder for them to access cheaper capital. So you're going to see more small businesses going bankrupt. So that doesn't mean that big corporations are immune. I'm just saying that small businesses... You're going to see more of those, more of those bankruptcies compared to larger businesses, larger corporations. Okay, so in my Federal Reserve videos, in my interest rate videos, I've stated the case on why I believe that the situation is going to get worse, that I believe the economy is going to degrade. And I believe that it all boils down to a high interest rate environment. That's it's very straightforward. However, the big banks, the big institutions and the Federal Reserve are saying the opposite. They're saying that right now the economy is booming. The Federal Reserve of Atlanta is expecting GDP growth of 5.6% in this quarter, Q3. So that Q3 covers July, August, and September. So if you think that a recession is coming, the big institutions are saying that that was so yesterday. Goldman Sachs just said that the probability that the U.S. falls into a recession over the next 12 months is now at a 15% chance. Bank of America is saying that a soft landing is the most likely scenario. 
so that's what they're saying, but not everyone feels the same. According to the most recent survey by Kenny Piak, 71% of Americans feel that the US economy is either not good or in poor shape. So I believe that that's a, that is a big discrepancy. So that doesn't sound like a booming economy. That doesn't sound like GDP growth of 5.6%, but let's see what happens. All right, so today's video is a high level overview of the current situation. September 13th is gonna be a big day. That's when the inflation report comes out. September 20th is when the Federal Reserve will decide whether to raise interest rates even higher or not. So please subscribe. I'm gonna keep you updated on all of this. Thank you for the support and I wish you a very nice day. Take care. All right, so we're seeing a lot of the same kind of stuff that we saw from Minority Mindset. Uh, maybe uh, some slight differences in what he's saying. Um, but I think the the key here is a lot of people are pointing and indicating towards um, some changes in the future, right? People are running out of money um, and it's affecting their day-to-day. -day. It's affecting their ability. And, and the whole concept of living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck is um, starting to be felt uh, by a lot of people. So David, what are your thoughts on just the whole concept of, of people who are living paycheck to paycheck? They feel like they're stuck in that rat race. They feel like they're stuck on the hamster wheel. I'm not necessarily living to uh, paycheck to paycheck, but I do feel like I'm on a hamster wheel sometimes, and I'm sure you feel mm -hmm. that way too. Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's kind of your, your thoughts on trying to figure out ways to get traction right now when it does feel like, like you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, right? The escalator's going down, and we're, we feel like we're trying to go up that escalator. Well, there's a resistance, I think, mentally to accepting that's the case. Okay, we this isn't the first time we've been sharing the information in these videos. I think people's emotions are starting to get a little queasy, like, is it actually bad? But I've been saying it for like a year, maybe longer than a year. But there's a resistance. It's like, well, I don't feel that right now. That's not my truth. That's not my mm -hmm. experience. So I refuse to believe that I need to make any adjustments or I need to do things differently. That will hurt you. If you wait until you feel the problem, it may be too late. You really got to be smart about things. That's one thing that I would say. Another is there is a natural proclivity in human beings for comfort. So we start to establish a baseline of what is reasonable based on what we've had happen in life, which is stupid. I noticed this mm -hmm. when I was a deputy in the jail. If uh, the TVs were supposed to be turned off at 10 o'clock at night, but we would frequently just leave them on all night. And then when the inmates would be acting bad, we would turn off the TVs or I would start doing that. Like, okay, you guys want to make noise or be loud or talk mess, whatever it is, TVs go off. And the amount of whining blew me away. It was like, this isn't fair, right? Even though the rule was they're supposed to go off at 10 and technically every night they were getting grace, they were getting a bonus. They weren't grateful. They thought they deserved it. And I just noticed that about human nature that we will frequently create a baseline of what's fair based on what's always happened. Not about if yeah. it actually is naturally fair. Like, is it fair that we have a minimum wage in this country? Like we're used to that. We would say it's not fair if we don't get minimum wage, but if you existed 200 years ago when there was no minimum wage, you would be over the moon ecstatic that there's a minimum wage, right? Cause theoretically in a purely capitalistic world, there isn't minimum wage. You get what you're worth and you get what you can negotiate and you have to build skills to get more. I just want everyone to understand what you think of as fair, an eight hour work day breaks all the time. Like that's cool. Well, I'm glad we have it. It's a amazing blessing. That's not how things worked the majority of the time. Like when mm -hmm. you lived 2000 years ago, you didn't clock out at a certain time and say, I don't have to work anymore. You got off of whatever you did for employment and you were like, now I got to go find food. And then you found food. You're like, now I got to cook and eat this food. And then you ate it. And you're like, now I got to protect myself from what's coming. Or I got to go find firewood for the fire. And then it was, how am I going to chop down the trees to build the house that I need to live in? Because winter's coming. How am I going to get the skins from animals to keep me and my family warm when winter comes? You were always thinking about the next thing to do. That's actually how human beings have survived for a long time. It is a relatively new thing that we have all these requirements. And I don't want people to get stuck in this fantasy that a recession can't happen. That's part of why we got in this mess is every time we went into a recession, they just bailed us out by printing money. 
So I really think people should take that understanding of human nature and be grateful for the things they have and work very hard. Uh, that hamster wheel feeling often means we have to do something different. And most of the conversations you and I have had, Kyle, and the other people on the team have been, guys, we need to shake ourselves out of what we're used to. It doesn't work anymore. The cheese is moved. Do we want to wait till we're starving before we go look for that cheese? Or do we want to be disciplined and start taking the steps now to put ourselves in a position to get that cheese so that when everyone else is starving, we've got the cheese. We can tell them where to go and we can control and make sure the cheese isn't taken to the wrong people. That's just my two cents. A lot of this is human psychology and it relates to how our emotions dictate our behaviors. We've all been lied to. We have these beliefs that we deserve certain things that I don't know that we do. Do you, do you does that sit right with you or do you see it a different way? No, that sits really, really good. Um, real quick before I jump into that, just a reminder, if you guys want to jump on this call and have a conversation live right now with me and David, text the number below. We want to uh, hear from you guys who are watching live. But um, no, that that sits really, really well. And, and I'm trying to think of like times back in our past, David, where I've actually learned that sort of psychological shift myself from you um i remember you used to say like anything like anything that we get in life is really just a bonus right the fact that we're we uh, we often set our expectations of what we think we deserve way 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 too high a yeah. lot of times because of that baseline right the baseline was set we were spoiled or the baseline was uh, we were spoiled by the, the economy, right? Where we were getting all this free stimulus money and money was easily flowing. We should have been looking at that as a bonus. We should have been looking at that, okay, this is great, but this probably will not be here. Um, and I should look at every opportunity for me to earn income or to buy real estate or to invest in whatever assets I'm investing in. That's all a bonus, but don't expect for it to always be that way because it's funny we do we get mad we get upset um we build up that resentment when we see that the cheese has been moved we just all assume oh it's it's always going to be there it's not going away i did i ever tell you about that story that kirk cameron told about the people that took the plane ride does that sound familiar no. uh -uh. I, he had this really good story of two different people that were both taking the exact same plane ride let's say from california to hawaii okay one of the people was told, listen, this is going to be the most exquisite experience you've ever had. The stewardesses are gorgeous. They're super nice. The food is incredible. The movies are in surround sound. You have so much leg room. You're going to be on cloud nine. There's no turbulence. It's going to be one of the best experiences that you've ever had. The other person was told, hey, you're going to Maui. But you need to understand this is going to be horrible. You're going to be air sick the whole time. Turbulence is going to make you nauseous. The There's going to be no food. or If there is, it's going to be terrible. They're going to serve you a tiny little bit of a drink. It's not going to be that much. The stewardesses are grumpy and in a bad mood. Uh, the pilots miss the airport half the time and have to circle around. It's going to be like eight hours long. It's going to be terrible. But on the other end, you get to go to Maui. Okay. Then those people took that flight. They had the exact same experience. So objectively, mm -hmm. they should have had the same emotional reaction to that experience. And it was just a regular flight, a little bit of turbulence, not really any food, cramp legs. There was a bathroom if you need it, but you had to wait for other people to use it. Someone else wanted to get up and you had to get out of your seat to let them get up and go to the bathroom. But at other times, you got to watch a movie and just sit there on the plane or read a book, right? Regular flight. The person that was told it'll be incredible was pissed the entire time. They felt like a victim. They thought they got ripped off. That's not what I was expecting. Their baseline was set way too high. So they were miserable and they didn't even enjoy it when they got to Hawaii. They complained about it. They wanted Yelp. They left bad reviews. They texted all their friends about how terrible it was. The person who was told it was going to be really hard was like, dude, this was awesome. They couldn't stop talking about how great it was because their expectations were set low. Their baseline was really low, so when the flight was right in the middle, they thought this was the best thing ever, and they got to Maui in four hours, not eight. That is such a crucial part of our happiness as a human. If you are told that life is a Disney movie, that bad things don't happen, that people don't get sick, that car accidents don't occur, that you'll never get your heart broken, that everyone is supposed to love you, that wealth comes if you just exist, that you deserve love just for breathing, 
You will frequently and constantly be frustrated by life. You will be outperformed by everybody else that knows it's a competition. If you're told life is a battle, it's a struggle, it's hard, no one cares about you, they care about themselves, it's not their job to be your friend or to take care of you. If anybody takes care of you, you should be super grateful because you're not owed that. You only get what you can negotiate, and that's based off the skill you bring to the marketplace, whether that's in work, whether that's in friendships, whether that's in romantic relationships, whatever it is. You only get what people are willing to give you, so you better do the things that make them want to. Then you're grateful every day. right? It works in life. It works in business. It works in so many things. When we deal with people that are chronically unhappy, employees that we have, clients that Kyle's working with to try to sell them a house, they always have an expectation that it should be easy, that there shouldn't be anyone else that wants to buy the same house they want to buy, that the seller should take an offer way less than asking price. Now, the irony is when they're selling their house, they never want to take an offer at way less than asking price. Mm -hmm. They think people should pay way more. It's ridiculous when you objectively look at these things. But they're never happy because they think everything should be easy. Then you get a person that had a really bad experience with another agent, like Kyle just had a call with someone yesterday. The person that had a terrible experience with an agent in Roseville, uh, his brother knows me, so his brother reached out. I connected him with Kyle. He thinks Kyle's the best thing ever. Why? Because his baseline was set really low. He didn't have high expectations and entitlement. That is a huge part of life, and I think that's probably what you were getting at, Kyle, when I was like, we should look at everything like it's a bonus. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I got a couple couple directions I want to take it, but I'm going to kind of throw you a curveball here. How, what's your definition, or how do you define enough? Ooh, well, I mean, that depends on your baseline. I think enough is you can survive. That's the best way to look at it. Like, I, do I have enough food to eat to live? Not, is this the best sushi I've ever had? Do I have a warm bed to sleep in where I'm safe? Not, is this the most expensive mattress I could get with an exquisite headboard? Like, I think a lot of people would be surprised if they saw my house because it's a big house. It's like 2,600 square feet. It's more than I need. Mm -hmm. But I don't have fancy stuff in it because I just don't care. I have a leather couch that I'm really grateful to have. It's probably 15, 20 years old. But like, at what other time in history could people sit on leather? That was a luxury that even yeah. kings didn't have access to, right? And I'll see people see it and be like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Why don't you have a real couch? And like those same people are never happy. They always need new stuff because they always believe that they deserve more. Think about like the people that complain about taking showers. If you don't take a shower every day, it's gross or they feel gross if they can't take two showers a day. And I think, well, human beings used to, if you didn't live near a stream of water, you probably went months without taking a shower at all. Like it's a luxury that we get to take it. So I tend to look at enough, like, can I survive? I like that. Uh, there's some people defending me here in the comments. They're saying Kyle is the best. Um, Cause you kind of made it sound like the reason the guy liked me is cause he had low expectations, which is true. I love to deliver when people have low expectations, but I, I, I got the point of what you were saying. Did it let sound me like ask I was you, throwing shade at you? That's not what I meant. No, I know you didn't mean that at all. Um, let me ask you this, David. Um, for somebody who's maybe just hearing this for the first time tonight, right, of, of lowering their expectations, maybe someone who's had a Pollyanna view of the world and the economy or their life, right, and, and they're starting to be awakened to the idea that there could be tough things mm. uh, in life. H how do they make that shift, right? What, what is that? I mean, is it as simple as just like, lowering your expectations or is there more to it psychologically do you start off by by refusing to insist that you know best okay a lot of people in life think that their perspective is the right perspective and everyone else needs to think how they think but they've never objectively taken a step back and asked where that perspective came from okay i do this all the time like let's use romantic relationships for example how many people tell me in the comments watch Disney movies. And that's where your understanding of what romance is supposed to look like came from. Okay. In a Disney movie, a prince shows up having fought dragons and conquered Kings and built himself up from a nothing into a huge deal. And he just picks a princess who they don't show her doing anything special to catch his eyes. She just exists and she's pretty. 
And he decides he's going to drop everything he's doing to love her and fight for her for his the end of his days. And then he gets all of his satisfaction from that. Now, think about how real life works. You rarely ever come across men that are like, yeah, that's what I want to do. What men are going to be thinking is, well, what did she do that made me want to fight for her? Just like women are going to be thinking the same thing. Well, what did he do that make me want to respect him? That's how human nature works. Mm -hmm. If you got your idea from Disney, you are almost guaranteed to be disappointed. Now, I'm going to try to be careful with how I'm saying this, but imagine that you are watching um, online X-rated videos. We're not going to say the word because YouTube doesn't like that. Okay. And you got your idea of how SEX is supposed to work from seeing that type of a thing. That is not how women operate. Like they don't want to just, they're not just going to fall all over you because you exist. You just show up at their house and the next thing you know, they can't help themselves. You do things to get a girl interested in you. If that is where a guy learned how that stuff is supposed to work, he's going to be eternally frustrated. Always feeling like he's getting ripped off. Even if he's got a great partner, it's going to feel like it's not enough because his expectations got set somewhere. Now let's take this whole idea here and let's blow it up to everything in life. Most of us got our ideas of how the world works from what we watch on TV. You see commercials for things and you think that's what I'm supposed to want. If you don't know yourself what you want in life and you don't know who you are, you fall for what you're told you're supposed to want. Mm. Right? You're told like, okay, that girl that looks like Pamela Anderson is the ideal woman. So I'm supposed to want that. Then you go out there and you chase the Pamela Andersons and you get your heart broke over and over and over because they're addicted to attention and they constantly cheat on you and they were never going to like you in the first place. They use you for stuff and you think, well, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. You just pick that type of a person or you're a girl and you have the bad boy that gets shown. That's what you're supposed to like or it's Harry Styles. Like You don't ask yourself the question of what do I want? You let something else download that software into your mind and into your heart and you operate off of that, but it's not truth. It's not how the world actually works. It's not how human beings feel. It's a version of it you got told. You are setting yourself up for a life of disappointment, and it's your own fault because you refuse to think for yourself. It's lazy yeah. to let somebody else give you an idea of how the world works. And if we're being honest, the only people that are putting those ideas in your head are doing it because they have something to gain. Cinnabon wants you to buy their cinnamon stuff. That's why they make it smell so good. They're not trying to make you fit. K Jewelers wants you to spend a lot of money on a diamond ring. They're not trying to give you a happy marriage, right? Wedding planners want you to spend $80,000 on one day. They don't care if you stay married and have good kids. Like it doesn't make sense to me that we spend $80,000 on a wedding when you don't even think about how the marriage is going to work. The people mm -hmm. who are selling real estate investing courses don't really care if you're successful. They just want to get your money and they're going to tell you whatever they have to. If we're walking through life, la -di da Pollyanna, completely oblivious to human nature, we deserve to be unhappy all the time. That's not how life works. But if we make a halfway decent effort to, to try to see through BS and to assume that not everyone has our best interest in mind, and to look at how things work in the rest of the world and ask if it works this way too, you start to see through this stuff constantly and you will find yourself happier. It amazes me. I meet people from third world countries and they are legit happier than Americans are. Legit. Oh, yeah. They don't have running water. They don't have electricity or they have blackouts where the electricity gets turned off for periods of time and they are a happy, better mood, better attitude type. That should be impossible. But it's not because they're not trained that nothing bad should happen in the world. They're trained that no one cares about you and you got to form a tribe of people and uh, earn the right to be protected by them and protect them. And so when good things come their way, they feel really good. We're most happy when we're most grateful. But no one's grateful for what they think they deserve. That's the problem. If the person had the perfect flight, but they were told they were going to have the perfect flight, they're not grateful for that. The person that we're told... Uh, you're going to have a terrible flight and then had a good flight, they're grateful because they got more than they thought they deserved. That's really the key is understanding you don't deserve what you think. You don't deserve to just go out there and analyze five houses and buy a house and the tenant never gives you a problem and nothing ever goes wrong and your boss just dumps money on you. It's walking around with that virus. 
that problem, the software that you put into your computer that keeps so many people unhappy, that keeps them from taking action, that keeps them from feeling good about the action that they've already taken. Like I was thinking today at the gym, how I hate working out. We always complain about it, but Mm -hmm. how lucky are we that someone puts together machines and weights and controls the temperature and has padded benches and I get workout gloves that stop me from getting caught. Like they've made it as easy as it could possibly be to be fit. And when it's all laid out for me, I still have, oh, I have to go work out. I'd rather just be ripped and not have to do this. Like that little thought is in my head all the time. It is a virus that stops me from being happy. And and all of us that are watching these videos, the reality is starting to hit. This is how it's been the whole time. If you adapt quicker, you get rid of those thoughts. You get rid of that belief that you're entitled to something. You will see the right move to make. You will see the better job to take. You'll see the, in your mind, you'll visualize what a good work day looks like. And you will go into it with enthusiasm and you will keep your job. If you don't, you're going to be the one that gets fired. That's really good, man. So, I mean, that's something I think people are going to go back and, and re-listen to that because that was really, really deep and very helpful i think for a lot of people um it sounds like the first step is starting to exercise that muscle of thinking for yourself and recognizing that almost every other voice that is speaking to you whether that be hollywood whether that be uh, disney whether that be your boss or uh whoever the government right everybody's out there to sort of speak or uh, share their own agenda. And a lot of times they're not actually looking out for yourself. So you have to, you have to be willing to think for yourself and recognize that the perspectives that you may have been given your entire life could be incorrect or could be wrong, or maybe just wrong for you. Right. And that's going to affect your level of happiness because you're always trying to live up to something that you know, you're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's going to lead to not feeling good about yourself. Right. So I think that's a big part. How would somebody maybe start exercising that look, that muscle start thinking for themselves, start maybe taking some baby steps in that direction. And you start with humility. So let's use another analogy of like food. Okay. Let's say that I was raised on a certain diet of food. That's not healthy. You were raised on a diet of food that is more healthy. Okay. You didn't eat processed foods in your house. We did right. Mm -hmm. The foods I eat feel right to me. They don't feel wrong. It's all I've ever done. Right. And my pride would say, I know better than Kyle. He's wrong and I'm right. So many people would do that. And then you ask one question, like why? And their whole argument falls apart. They don't have a why. They're arguing not because they're right, but because they want to believe they're right because they're comfortable that way. Humility says, maybe I don't know the best. Maybe I should look at the way that Kyle's eating. What do you know? Eating foods that are not processed makes me feel a lot better. I didn't even know I felt bad because I always ate this way. Spending habits work like that. Work ethic works that way. So many people have just assumed I'm supposed to work from nine to five. And if I have to get there earlier than nine or stay later than five, I'm a victim. I'm here. I'm clocked in. My job is just to do this one little thing. I stand at the cash register and I help the people. And when no one's at the cash register, I shouldn't have to work. Why not get the broom and sweep the floor? You got to be there anyways. Humility is that first step. Maybe the way you're doing it isn't all there is to it. And opening your mind to the thought that fighting to get your way or fighting to get someone to understand your perspective. Ever been in a relationship with somebody or known someone that insisted on like, you need to see it from their perspective, right? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, for sure. It can be miserable because oftentimes their perspective is not better. Their perspective is the problem. That's why they're chronically unhappy. That's why Mm -hmm. they're overweight. That's why they're broke. The last thing they need to do is to say, you need to understand what this is like for me. They need to close their mouth and say, how do I understand what your diet is like? I need to look at both of our things before I can objectively determine that my way is better than your way. What's that little, uh, can you share with people the the way that you and I communicate with each other sometimes that Alice and Armstrong, not here's what I need you to do for me. Yeah. So the, the wrong way of communicating when you're fighting to get your way is you tell somebody, this is what I need from you. And if you don't do it, here's the consequences. Okay. So what this looks like is like, Hey, I didn't like the way you said that. And the person goes, fine, then I won't talk to you at all. 
and you're like, well, you're not going to talk to me at all. And I'm not going to show you any love. Oh, you're not going to show me any love. Well, then I'm not going to reply to your messages. Oh, you're not going to reply to messages. I'll go talk to someone else. Oh, you're going to go talk to someone else. I'll go sleep with someone else. Oh, you're going to sleep with someone else. I'll sleep with three people. And you spiral into negativity trying to win. This is what most people do. Oh, my boss isn't going to give me a raise. I'm not going to work. And the boss is like, you're not going to work. I'm going to hire someone else to do your job, right? What we talk about, Kyle and I, is here is my need. What do you need from me to give me that? Okay. So let's say uh, a basketball example, right? Because that's going to feel less weird than the romantic thing. But this works really good <laughs> in romantic relations, right? Kyle, I need the ball in my hand so we can score more. Uh, what do you need from me to get me the ball? Well, you're not coming off the screens and you're not open, right? I can't, I'm going to turn it over if I try to throw it to you. What do you need from me in order to get open better? I didn't realize I wasn't getting open. I need you to tell the small forward to set a screen for me in this position. What do you need for me to go tell him? I could go tell him right now, but he's going to want to know if he sets that screen, he's going to be able to get something else. What can you give me that I can give him? And you go back and forth. And the beauty of it is you are taking responsibility for getting yep. your own need met. You're not just dumping it on someone else and saying, you better fix this problem, right? And what and when you go back and forth like that, you build a partnership, whether it's in business or whether it's in a romantic relationship, it's ownership. And everyone likes working with someone that's taken ownership over the situation. I mean, I think that's really what it comes down to, because <clears throat> when I asked you what the first step was, right, you said the first step is ego. The first step is humility, right? Letting go of your ego and being humble and starting to do things a little bit differently. And when you mentioned like, yeah, if I do that differently, it's going to feel hard. It's going to feel like I'm going against the grain, right? And the same thing, what you're doing when you say, what can I do to help you? You're doing something that's hard. And I think a lot of times we just want to manipulate people subconsciously to do things for us so that we don't yes. have to do it so that we can get out of it. We end up letting go of that pers personal responsibility. And then what happens? Everything crumbles, right? Or we're just always upset. And that's not a good place to be. Great point. When it comes to making more money, which is a skill I want everyone here to understand, people that are that make money don't just get lucky in life. And even if you do get lucky in life, you still had to develop another person that could do it. So I will agree there's privilege. Like if you're born to a family of really good basketball players, you're going to get better coaching. It's you're going to have a better chance at being good at basketball than someone who's not. But with that better coaching comes a higher standard that's imposed on you. It doesn't just happen that you're good at basketball. There's all there's all times kids from the same family that don't take the same journey as the one that did, and the one that did gets better. What I find is when people go through an imposed standard, they have a similar pattern of how their mind develops. If you're a Navy SEAL, if you're a doctor, if you're a successful person at anything, there's very similar patterns in all of those people that leads to them making more money. So you could either take what I'm about to say at a face value right now, and it will lead to more money, or you could already be making money and you would say, oh yeah, that's what I did to get to this point, but it's the same stuff, right? In pillars in the offensive section where I talk about the skill of making more money, there's five different chapters on that. Well, the, there's six because the first is the principles that go into it, but the first concept is the pursuit of excellence. You have to fall in love with the process of becoming great. If you are in love with mediocrity and comfortability, you're not going to be wealthy. So just give it up. You might stumble into wealth like as a crypto investor, but it never lasts, right? You might stumble into like you have incredible athletic ability and you made it into a professional league. But if you don't love the pursuit of getting better, you don't stay there. The next is skill development. You have to be intentional about building skills. They do not just happen to you. You have to pursue being good at things. I didn't get good at podcasting on accident. I didn't get good at writing books on accident. I didn't get good at human psychology on accident. I was always competitive and always asking, how can I be better? And I recognized I needed to improve my skills. The next is this idea of leadership. And I define leadership in pillars as the one who embraces responsibility. Most people, if you're honest with yourself, and if you look around at the people at your job, are doing their best to avoid responsibility. That's someone else's job. I don't want to figure it out. I want someone else to. I will route this, this question to this person. I will say, I don't know. 
I'm not going to take responsibility to figure it out as if it was me that needed to know. I'm going to figure out how someone else can do it. Doing that is like going to the gym every day and being proud that you didn't lift the weights. Taking on responsibility is hard, but it is literally what makes you stronger and better. It is stupid to go to a gym every day and brag that you didn't have to touch a weight. Yet so many people will go to their job and brag that they didn't have to work hard. I get paid $30 an hour to do nothing. That's cool. What if you got paid $30 an hour to lift weights? And that led to getting $40 an hour at the next job and 55 at the next job. Like, why do we think that not doing hard things is admirable? It's stupid. And so that chapter talks about literally looking for areas in your current position where you can take on more responsibility and learning from it. Another one is the winning mindset, how winners think. It's approaching every day like this is a competition and I want to win it. Can you go to your job and leave every day knowing you outworked everybody else that was there? Can you look back at everything that happened and say, I did the best that I could at all of those or did I leave a weight unlifted and leave some strength behind that I could have developed? What I tell people is you need to approach every day at your job like it's the last day of tryouts and you don't want to get cut. If you're giving anything less than that, You can't really say that you deserve wealth. You can't really say you deserve playing time. You can't go complain to the coach and say, well, I'm not playing enough, so why would I try? If you're working harder than everyone else on the team, you're guaranteed to get better. And if you're getting better, eventually you will earn the right in a meritocracy to get playing time. And in that world, that's wealth. That's making money. And then the last point is performance improvement hacks. And these are actual tactical, practical things that a person can do to improve their performance, work longer, work harder, not get fatigued, be more efficient. It has everything from communication to what type of food you're eating to how you start your day to how to break up your day to what things are wearing out your brain you're not thinking about because people like Kyle and I have a very, what's the word I'm looking for? Like not rigid, but uh, brutal. Uh, That's still not the word I was looking for. I can't think of what it was. (laughs) But we have a very hard schedule. It is mentally draining trying to keep up with conversations with clients that are nervous, conversations with agents that don't want to accept the offer because they want to get more, conversations with employees, problems that are popping up. Okay, if we're going to do this, then that could happen. How are we going to handle that? Uh, Writing books, preparing for shows like this, looking at the people that are in Spartan League and asking ourselves how we can help them improve, how we can help improve Spartan League at all, finding the people that are going to be speaking in there, trying to pay attention to what's going on in the economy and how I can steer everybody in the right direction. It is exhausting trying to do this. And the only way that you can keep up with it is if you keep getting stronger, right? I've come up with some performance improvement hacks that I use so that when I get to the end of the day, like now, we're not exhausted and zombies. We still sound energized and we can still give value to you. Everybody here can do that. So if you want to check out the stuff that's in that book, that's guaranteed to make you more money if you go do it, head to biggerpockets.com slash pillars. This is literally the blueprint of what millionaires that I know all do. I don't know millionaires that just spend money stupidly or don't know what the P&L of their business looks like. I don't know millionaires that are not look good at making money. And I don't know many millionaires that don't do a really good job investing that money. Yeah. And those millionaires are also, like you said, they have that same rigid or demanding schedule, right? They are absolutely in yeah. tune with every part of their life. They're in tune with their diet. They're in turn in tune yes. with their schedule, with their workout plan, with their family, with their finances, with their business, with what the people in their business are doing with their properties, right? They have a finger in everything. And I think that we've, we've been talking about this in some of our leadership meetings, right? Human psychology, the human tendencies just to want to uh, maybe eventually take yourself out of those things. And what we have learned over time, we've had to kind of learn the hard, hard way in some ways is you, you, that is a false premise that is never going to happen. It's the opposite. We just have to get stronger. We have to get more in tune. We have to be more efficient. We have to be better at what we do. And we have to be willing to change those parts of our personalities that are resisting that. Yeah. It's, it's exact guy. If you guys really want to be wealthy, And you're not just saying it and you're not just here to be entertained. Look at it the same way you'd look at fitness. If you really wanted to be fit, you would watch what you eat, right, Kyle? Yep. Oh, for sure. That's that takes discipline. That is defense. Mm -hmm. That is the same way that you live by a budget. It requires discipline. And when you cut things out of your diet, you start to realize 
how much you relied on them for dopamine. Mm -hmm. Just yep. like when you cut things out of your, your spending, you start to realize how much you relied on them to feel good about yourself. You'll go through withdrawals. It will be hard. It's something you have to grind out. That is something that every fit person has to do. And being financially fit is the same way. But diet's not enough. You also have to go put your body through some kind of stress, right, Kyle? 100%. You're out there doing that right now with your hand all wrapped up, still putting yourself through stress and working out, right? Yep. That is what offense is. Working out is about constantly adjusting the way you're challenging your body. You're either lifting heavier weights, you're lifting them more times, you're doing different kinds of exercises. The minute that the exercise becomes comfortable, does that mean you just, you're done and you got there? Or does that mean you have to change it up? Got to change it up. Literally what you just described about what we're trying to do in business. The market is changing. We have to adapt, right? And then the last piece would be you can supercharge that wealth by investing it wisely. I don't have a great analogy for what that would look like in the fitness comparison, but that's what everybody here, if you actually want to be wealthy, dive into this concept that is in pillars, wrap it around yourself, start thinking this way, challenge yourself every day. Life becomes more fun when you're challenging yourself and when you're surrounded by other people that are doing it, you won't quit. Ever wonder why everybody in CrossFit is so close, Kyle? Because they're all doing the hard thing together. Yeah, they created a cult because that's the only way you get all those people to do those crazy ass CrossFit <laughs> yeah. workouts. Yeah, <laughs> You'd quit if they didn't have that, right? If you're really mm -hmm. pushing yourself, you need to be in a tribe, you need to be in a group, you need to have friends, you need to be around other people. I'm trying to speak life in you guys. This is something you need when you're really out there every day giving it your all. Consider Spartan League as the place that you can go. We want to have you. We want to help you grow. We want to hear your challenges and understand that the virus that stops you from getting there is the belief that it's supposed to just happen. And so much of that has come in your mind from social media, from TV, from influencers that want your money, from marketers that want to paint a picture of the world that's not real. And that stuff is making you sick. It's making you unhappy. Yeah, and uh, you you need to be, if, if, there, if you're looking to make change, right? Mikhail here says you need to be in Spartan League. That is exactly what Spartan League is about, right? It's about making that incremental change. And it starts with just one small thing, right? So just focus on one small habit that you want to start changing, right? It could be something as I'm going to try to go to the gym five days a week, start tracking that just one thing. Yeah. And then you can start stacking it and doing additional things, right? You can do your cold showers. You can do, I'm going to, I'm going to do no spend days, right? So I'm going to do three, no spend days a week. That means I'm not going to spend any extra money on anything else like i normally do maybe that's your wow. cutting down on something right yeah really and then the other part is like look look at what you can cut out of your diet start sh start shifting some things in your life just small gradual things but then build upon because i think a lot of times what happens is we try to jump in and just change our entire life like okay i'm gonna start waking up at 4 a.m and I'm going to quit alcohol, and I'm going to start eating healthy, and I'm going to work out two days a week. We try to just jam it all in at once, and then we fail, and then what happens? We just, it didn't work. It was too hard. I couldn't do it. Start small. Make some small uh, gradual shifts. Get around the people in the, the community that, that can help you do that, and you're going to start to see some really big changes over time. And don't wait until you're panicked and you've lost your job and there's nothing to invest in, and, and yeah. you need the money, but you've been spending it. Don't wait until it's terrible. Start now before it gets worse. Now, I'm that doesn't mean you have to join Spartan League. We'd like you to, but if you're not going to join Spartan League, adapt these principles now. Defense, offense, investing. When you wake up every day, how am I going to protect the money I've made? Every dollar you make is yours to keep until you give it to somebody else. How are you going to protect? I love Kyle's no spending day. It's going to force his brain to come up with creative solutions for how he's going to solve his problems without just relying on money. That's beneficial in more than just practical ways. That's really good. How am I going to make more money? How am I going to work harder? How am I going to be the best employee at my job? Okay, if I'm honest, for the last four years, I haven't given a good effort. My boss knows that. What is it going to take to win that person over so that they respect me again? I want my boss. I had a coach one time said, David, I want to see you come back after this summer of basketball. And I want everyone in this gym to say, what the hell got into that guy? I was a really smart player. I was a really disciplined player, but I wasn't an aggressive player. And he was like, I want people to come in and say, who the hell is that? How did he get that crazy? He was telling me to be aggressive. Can you aggressively change the way that other people look at you and your work ethic and what is respected about you?
And then what is your plan for investing? How are you going to continue to buy real estate? Because we have to keep doing it as the market's getting tough. Do not wait for it to get worse. And don't think that if you're if the market's been this good and you're not where you want to be, you know how much worse it's going to be when the market gets bad. I like to that light a fire under you type of approach. And that's what we're trying to get at here. You're getting more and more content that's starting to come out, talk about the bad economy, but it's still not as popular as Logan Paul and Dylan Dennis or like whatever stuff is going on in the news, Mexicans finding alien corpses, but you're going to start seeing more of this to where it's becoming like hopeless. And maybe there'll be another round of stimulus. And after that one, I don't know if we got anything left in the tank, right? It may be a problem. So it's important to us. That's why we're talking to you guys about it. The only thing that you know that you can control is your character and the effort that you put into the day and pushing yourself past where you are. So, uh, Kyle, I just want to thank you for being a great example of that, man. Like, even with your hand hurt, they wanted to see it. If you want to hold it up again, people wanted to see your sure. 14 it's stitches, healing. right? Yeah. Jigsaw there. Even with that, you're still in the gym. You're still tracking things. You're still telling me I need to get the tracking app that Spartan League is using to track the workouts, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been back in the gym about four weeks now, and I was just telling you I started lifting weights a little bit differently. I've been doing it really slow, which is way more painful, way more challenging, really hard, right? It's kind of easy when you're just pushing that weight as hard as you can. But when you're trying to let it down a controlled way really slowly, I've been sore every single day, and I think it's good. Are you guys doing that in your lives? Are you guys looking for what's going to make you sore and really pushing yourself? Or are you on that uh, treadmill or that hamster wheel that's not going anywhere? Yeah, and the cool thing about all of that, David, is when you when you do all of those things in your life, uh, you start to feel better about yourself. You like yourself better. You like other people better. Life is happier, and it's not dependent on how well the economy is doing. It's not dependent on, you know, who's in office. It's not dependent on how much money you made that month or how many properties you bought that month. It's like, you know what? I'm actually making all these changes and I'm moving the right direction. I'm around people that are helping me do that. Uh, you just enjoy life more, right? And then more opportunity sort of starts to come your way because of that. You do attract more people in your life and more opportunity in your life as a result. So that's one of the cool things about living that way too. It's not a Pollyanna way of living because it's very hard. It's very difficult. It's a, it's a challenge and a struggle every day. But when you sort of trick your brain into doing difficult things every day, you kind of just get used to the fact that, okay, I can do hard things and you become stronger and you're more, uh, you're more resilient when those things, the bad things start to come your way. That's absolutely right. And I love your point. You'll like yourself more. When you do it, that's really where the idea of Spartan League came from is that the Spartan warriors, at least by legend, they had a spear that they would use for offense and they had a shield that they would use for defense, but their shield guarded the person next to them, not them. They were not all uh, on my own in my own little world. I only take care of myself. They fought as a unit and you were dependent on the soldier next to you to protect you. That's the community that we're building. We want to protect the other members. We want to strengthen the other members. We want to do this all together. We want people that have excelled in one area to share that information with others. And now we are going to be changing this to where we're going to have different instructors that are going to be coming in to teach the group because they've excelled in these areas and they can teach other people how to be better with construction or rehabs or managing crews or building systems or making money or taxes or whatever the topics are going to be. Uh, I'm excited about it. I definitely think you guys should get in before the prices go up. Uh, but even yeah. if you wait, it's going to be a very good investment. And it's going to be a way to learn about real estate without all of the BS. I love it, man. Really, really good stuff. Um, that's pretty much all I had for tonight's topic, tonight's conversation. Uh, you guys start looking at your budget, start looking at your life, start looking at your habits. Look at the things that you can start to adjust, right? The Scale down the, the bad things, the bad habits. Start to try to scale up the good habit. But uh, this has been a really, really fun night. Absolutely. Kyle, do you have an example of our uh, spreadsheet that can be shared on this channel? Share the screen to go over what the um, budget tracker looks like mm -hmm. for defense. If not, we could look into it next week. But I'm curious if. Yeah, I think it'd take me a few minutes to pull up, so I don't right, quite we'll do have that it. Next week. We'll show you guys what it looks like to create a budget, how you form one, how you give every dollar a job, and how you put into place the stuff that I talk about in 
the pillars book pillars is the toughest book i ever had to write kyle had to listen to me venting about that one a lot just this is so damn hard to get these concepts into paper in a way that can make sense but i'm really happy with it and i do think this will become a movement that a lot of people will talk about we already have a contract to sell the book in airports so you guys will see this like when you're traveling it'll be at barnes and nobles it's uh hopefully going to be a bestseller so go get uh pre-order it and get ahead of time and get some of the the content and then bring that information into spartan league and start changing your life while everybody else falls behind Awesome. Well, on behalf of Mr. David Green, I'm Kyle Ranke. I hope everybody has a great weekend, and we will see you here next Friday for another YouTube Live. See you.